So as we continue our discussion on human genetics, genetics of us as humans, we've established already what that study is about, and we've established what recessively inherited disorders encompass. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and look at something that a lot of people don't often understand and don't realize is still possible, what are known as autosomal dominant disorders. So we'll entitle this next flowchart exactly that. Autosomal, meaning that of the autosomes, meaning that nothing, everything that are body cells, soma meaning body cells, not gametes, not sex cells, okay, not sperm and egg. Autosomal, dominant disorders. That's our next flowchart and our next series. So in order to understand autosomal dominant disorders, let's look at a very basic example in humans. In humans, we have a syndrome, a disorder called achandroplasia, okay? Achandroplasia. Fancy word, fancy name. What does this mean? Well, this is simply a type of dwarfism. So this is a problem with size, okay? Problem with growth, a type of dwarfism, okay? And specifically, we can state that in this situation, if you have a dominant allele, okay, remember, this is an autosomal dominant disorder, so already start thinking what a dominant allele would give you. A dominant allele, what we've learned so far, means that if you have just one copy of a dominant allele, you will always express that phenotype. That is known information to us. This is something we've established since Mendelian genetics. So this actually is displayed in a chandroplasia because when we look at a heterozygote individual that has a chandroplasia, we notice that they are indeed of a dwarf size. They are a dwarf. Thus, we know that this is a dominant disorder. They have just one copy of this achandroplasia gene, let's say. That gene is dominant. Thus, no matter what, no matter if the uh, other gene that they have is recessive, they will be a dwarf because of this dominance relationship seen. And what about the individual who's not a dwarf? So if I wrote over here, not dwarf, what would you say is above it? Who is not a dwarf? Not the heterozygote, but the homozygote. But which one? Homo recessive because this is an autosomal dominant disorder. So if you have the dominant allele, you have the disorder. That's the basic idea behind autosomal dominant disorders. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do these even happen? This seems kind of crazy because this would mean that if you have a dominant disorder, you would have a disorder just by expressing just one allele. And this is actually true because you are thinking on the right track in the sense that if you express just one allele and you have a disorder, this is often going to be considered what we call lethal, okay? The autosomal dominant disorders will often involve lethal alleles because of how uh, drastic and how catastrophic they can be. So usually what we understand is the idea that um, Usually, let's say, um, if we have a lethal allele that's recessive, let's say, this is the common situation. So I'll do the common situation first. If a, let's say, lethal allele, allele that will, let's say, cause death, be a very bad allele, if an, a lethal allele is recessive in quality, we would state that that allele is usually, it actually usually is passed down, generation to generation. Why can we say that, okay? How do we know that it's passed down generation to generation? Well, this is because this lethal allele being recessive can oftentimes be masked. Remember our sickle cell um, situation? Remember our cystic fibrosis situation? Those were all recessive lethal alleles, meaning that they were masked, meaning that you needed two copies in order to express a lethal phenotype. So this usually does get passed down because of this masking concept, and we state that if the person who has this lethal allele happens to be homozygous recessive, then they will experience ultimately death. They will experience ultimately the lethalness of this allele if they are homozygous recessive. Now let's contrast that right now by looking at the opposite. Let's say versus on the bottom, if quote unquote the lethal meaning that, let's say lethal is just another word for bad allele in this situation, if the lethal allele is equal to dominant. And that is actually our case over here in our autosomal dominant disorder. So this is of increased notice on this flowchart. 
If our lethal allele is dominant, what actually happens, interestingly enough, is that there's actually, usually, most of the time, death before, okay, death before um, maturation, okay, before the individual is completely mature, or, and if they're not completely mature, or reproduction as a whole. So if that individual never has a chance to mature completely, they never have a chance to even reproduce. In the lethal allele being recessive scenario, because it can be masked, most of the time people do mature normally because they don't express the lethal phenotype and they also pass on their traits because they don't express it. They don't even know that they have it, thus it is usually passed down. Same situation here. Of course not. This is where death happens before maturation or reproduction because the lethal allele is dominant. Because in this situation, the gene is usually, again, this is all usually, for the most part, not, it's actually usually not passed down generation to generation. Okay? Passed down gen to gen. Simply because the people who have this um, dominant trait, this dominant lethal allele, express it. And they don't have a chance to even mature completely because this lethal allele is being expressed. And it's being expressed so much that they're giving us a lot of problems in life. Okay, But I want you to actually question this because you have to actually ask yourself, well then, shouldn't all possible lethal alleles that are dominant be completely gone from our whole human, let's say, um, scope? Why would lethal alleles even be present if the people who have them usually don't reproduce because they usually don't even mature and they usually don't even pass down their genes? Well, so I want to ask yourself, is this always the case or is it? Right over here. A little bit of a contradiction that I'm going to show you is something known as, and this is actually pretty serious, something known as late onset disease. Very, very interesting idea here very very relevant to us as humans so this is our scenario usually we have recessive alleles they always show up recessive um, lethal alleles always show up because of the masking that happens etc I've met, went over that a million times the new novel situation is that if you have a lethal allele that's dominant what you expect is the person who has it will eventually die before they even get a chance to reproduce or mature thus they won't pass it down or will they? Or is it? Or is it passed down? Because of something known as late onset disease, we can state that the lethal allele, okay, in this situation, the lethal allele is, of course, dominant, okay? So let's make sure we establish that. The lethal allele is dominant, but, key word here, key idea, but there's a huge, huge scenario here that we have to understand. No symptoms. This is crazy no symptoms no symptoms until after reproduction age okay until after repro age meaning that this person will have kids will have a life everything will be okay until about the age of 40 in which they've already had kids in which those kids have already had their genes they will then start to express a late onset disease. A classic and very sort of sad example of this is something known as Huntington's. Okay, you've probably heard of it before. It's called Huntington's disease. This is an example of an autosomal dominant disorder that shows late onset. Huntington's disease. Okay, Huntington's disease. This is uh, often labeled as a disease that causes gradual neural, so this is of the nervous system, so that's a very big system, very important brain system, degradation, gradual neural degradation, degradation, okay, meaning that the neurons start breaking down, the nervous system starts breaking down gradually, which is not good, very, very bad, so bad that this actually causes uncontrolled movements, it's a very classic example of Huntington's disease, Okay, when you see uncontrolled movements in an individual that's about over 40 years old, this is eventually going to lead to death because it's going to happen so often and so much so that there's going to be a great amount of neural degradation throughout. Again, this is late onset, so the symptoms actually show up after about 40 years old. So symptoms after the person turns about 40 years old, 
oftentimes people that you know when they're about 40 they already have kids for the most part that's the scary part of Huntington's that they have kids even though this disease shows up much later on at about 40 years old because it's dominant you have to respect and understand the fact that there's a very high chance of a child getting it because what is the difference between a dominant disorder and a recessive disorder so let me write this down high chance of child getting it okay what's the difference between a dominant disorder and a recessive disorder a recessive disorder so we'll say recessive you need two alleles to express it you need both alleles both let's say little a little a but what if you have a dominant disorder all you need is one allele all you need is that dominant allele let's say all you need is capital a and underscore it could be a capital a or it could be a lowercase a doesn't matter this will always express itself because it's dominant same situation for Huntington's disease this child has a very high chance of getting Huntington's disease simply because they would have to be lowercase a lowercase a which we know from our Punnett squares is a rare rare Punnett square result okay and finally sort of on a positive note we can end this video is that there is a very interesting and very good genetic test available to check for this disease because it's really critical to make sure we understand our own genetics and understand what are we susceptible to and what are our children susceptible to so this is a great way to make sure we understand whether or not we have Huntington's because we can't tell until after 40 and oftentimes after 40 it's too late you've already had kids and those kids have a high chance of getting this late onset disease as well so that covers our autosomal dominant disorder story um, and we're going to continue our discussion on human genetics um, by looking at chromosome number in the next video.